Good evening, I'm Tom Ryan, local architect and chief preservation officer of Naperville Preservation, the host of tonight's talk on adaptive reuse of historic buildings. I first met John after he gave a talk at the traditional building conference last year in Lake Forest on building codes, a surprisingly useful tool for adaptive reuse. He's an architect as well as a building department official, so that's probably what made it interesting to most the mostly architect audience. What I thought would be the most boring talk of the two of the two day conference turned out to be one of the best. Why we've asked him to speak tonight. This is the first of what we hope to be many of many future talks from a variety of Chicago land towns on adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Perhaps a kind of traveling road show. So let the show begin and welcome John Curley. All right, well, uh, looks, looks like uh, we're ready to go. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, this is a, a topic I speak, or a good portion of this is a topic I speak about pretty frequently. Um, there is very little conversation in my uh, profession of uh, code enforcement or building officials right now to talk about the flexibility that exists in building codes. It seems like a non sequitur to most people, uh, but there are tools that I'm going to show some of them today. It gets the, the in, in order to learn some of these tools, it's literally a two day seminar for architects. So I'm going to be 50,000 feet just talking about trying to make sure that everyone understands that they exist and encourage everyone to be interested in using them because uh, it's a really important tool on trying to uh, redevelop our, our main streets, which is a big passion of mine. So um, I'm going to scroll through just a couple of quotes that I really enjoy. Um, I'm not only going to talk about building codes today, we're going to talk about the, all, the, all the tools that Aurora has been using to uh, uh, redevelop our downtown. Many of them are economic development tools. I'll touch on those. Um, uh, but I wanted to start with part of the challenge that uh, developers uh, feel about historic rehab. There's a lot of risk involved in historic rehab. And you'll see from quotes here um, that... Um, I got to... Sorry, I got to look here. There we go. So I just want to cycle through a couple of quotes that you can read while I'm talking. Uh, so uh, the the history of the the flexible tools or the existing building code, it's called now, started really in the 80s. Uh, so the building codes have existed for decades and decades before they really got uh, attempted to get a real good handle on making. Uh, codes uh, more uh, adaptable and user-friendly for existing buildings. There were some rules that were very, really archaic, and frankly, the thresholds were so low that you almost always ended up using new building codes to solve existing building code issues. Um, so I'm, I'm going to scroll through some of these quotes that I enjoy, but the, the, the gist of it is that if, if we do not come up with flexible tools that make things uh, create more certainty in redevelopment projects, they will never happen. And many of these quotes are from the 80s and 90s when um, uh, uh, New Jersey, Ohio, and a couple of Eastern states were really grappling with what to do in one of the three national codes at the time. So I first came familiar with these codes by training from the city of Aurora when I was in the private sector as an architect, was interested in using these tools and I found them really pretty cumbersome, frankly. Uh, you need to dig into them and use them uh, pretty routinely, uh, which you don't get the opportunity to do very much as a design professional working on uh, smaller projects. Uh, so one of, uh, so uh, um, about, in two, about, about 2000, what happened is the three national codes were combined into the ICC codes, a national code. And one of the things they struggled with when they were adopting this code was how to deal with how all of the different model codes dealt with existing buildings. What they did really was they punted and said, okay, all of almost all of the uh, methodologies that were permitted in the uh, BOCA code, which was our regional code, the SBC code, which was the Southern code, and then the code they had out West were all slight, they were different and their methodologies were different. So they essentially threw them all into the same pot. And uh, we adopted our first version of this in 2000, in 2001, adopting the 2000 
um, uh, ICC codes and the existing building code. And I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a little bit too much time between slides here talking too much. So I apologize for that. So today I was asked to talk on uh, several topics. Um, how to identify and preserve historic buildings, um, how they can be repurposed at a lower cost and less harm to the environment, and how uh, communication between all the stakeholders uh, can uh, result in a, a more effective use of these tools and a redevelopment of our downtown. I'm very proud to say that Aurora's downtown has transpired, been working for the city of Aurora for 24 years. Uh, our downtown has changed immensely in 24 years. I remember uh, previous years as I had worked in a local architectural firm in Aurora uh, where nothing pretty much had changed for the six, eight years I, I had been paying attention. There was some changes, but we had, we had a TIF district as an example. I'll talk about that in a minute. Bill didn't really generate anything. We had some casino money that was being generated and that was being used to make some improvements downtown, uh, but it never really generated uh, enough activity and enough interest to redevelop a lot of the buildings that we've been able to in the last eight years. <clears throat> so I kind of in summary, what I'm, what I'm hoping to do today is to show, show everyone how we attempted to make more certainty and predictability of our regulations and, our, and the financial stake that we might take into a project to make sure that developers realize we're interested in your being here and we're interested in this building being rehabbed. So the uh, first slide about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that I'm kind of getting cut off at the top there a little bit. So identifying historic structures. Um, I, I will say that I don't exactly agree with uh, the National Park Service on everything. I think anybody that's in this field likely has a similar feeling. I would suggest there are times when um, determinations being made by the National Park Service, which makes determinations on historic uh, preservation for tax credits and other things where it, the, the line that they've drawn is so difficult, it's almost impossible to save the building. Uh, and there've been times when it seems like it's not enough. So it, it is a very challenging thing, I will say. Uh, but defining what's historic is important on qualifying for tax credits and qualifying for some local incentives as well sometimes. The way I, I, look, I like to look at it is kind of the Simon Sinek uh, approach to uh, what is your why? So why does your community exist? Why does it exist where it's at? Why, uh, what are the important things that have happened in your community and how they fit into the context of our, his our history? So it, it's, it's kind of a simplistic way of looking at it, but that's, that's kind of the approach that I look at. Uh, it's not exactly what the National Park Service has, to be honest, but, uh, and we've, it's not that Aurora saved every possible uh, historic structure in our downtown, the, the one we lost that I still wish we could have figured out a way to save because it was a magnificent building was our Masonic Temple had a fire and there was really no way to save it. But I was interested in trying to figure out, trying to solve that puzzle for a good 10 years. And it was such a white elephant of a building. It was really challenging to figure out. So this is a picture. I'm going to talk about some slide, uh, some some examples along the way. This is our GAR memorial. So this is a Civil War memorial uh, to those lost, those Aurorans and regional people lost in the Civil War. Also became our first library. Uh, clearly, this would be a historic building that they better stay there forever. Um, it's an important it's an important thing for the city of Aurora. We spent a lot of money uh, rem remodeling this building. Unfortunately, it was built. Um, so a little bit of history here, it was built on terrible soil. Uh, this is on our island, which was primarily fill. Uh, in addition to that, at, at uh, almost insult to injury of not being on great foundation, the someone decided, um, I'm trying to remember the time frame, I want to say it was in the teens, the 19 teens, that they wanted more headroom in the basement. They, they literally lifted this building by two courses of stone and added stone to add uh, basement height. In doing so, they damaged the foundation pad that was in place that actually was mitigating for the fact that it had poor soil underneath it and caused a lot of problems down the road. Anyway, we've, had, we've, we've invested a lot in this building. It's an important building, and actually, I hope you would come visit it. We've remodeled the, uh, 
the basement uh, for exhibits that aren't uh, uh, Civil War related. Uh, and our accessible route, which you might notice here, is in the back of the building uh, in, in the basement with a lift. So um, that's uh, one, of, one of our historic structures. I think I've got another one here. So another thing that would make things historic is they're very unique. So this is our Elks building, uh, Elks Lodge in downtown. This is a, a, a fantastic example of a Mayan revival style building. Mayan revival buildings uh, were in vogue for about 10 years, if that, in the 20s before the depression. Uh, after some uh, discoveries of, uh, uh, I think, well, I used to assume it was Mayan uh, uh, architecture. Um, and this is a really interesting building. We were able to save this. It's got uh, almost 30 units in it now too. So it's a, a unique structure, and again, was worth, was valuable to save. Quick, quick information about cost and environmental impact. So what I'm going to show you with some of the tools that we've used for uh, economic development in Aurora are uh, a, lot, a lot about tax credits. Um, uh, rem it is more expensive to remodel existing buildings. There's no two ways about it. It is. Um, some of the, I want to show you some of the tools that mitigate some of those costs. One of them is historic tax credits. Um, when we started using historic tax credits regularly, that's when we started accelerating what was happening in our downtown. So I think it's a very important linchpin of our redevelopment. Um, and by doing so, you're from an environmental impact, you're obviously you're, you're uh, reducing waste and the tax credits can offset your demolition costs uh, and remod extra remodeling costs. And then in addition, I think what most people uh, feel sad about when we lose structures is generally the buildings that are, the, 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 the comparison costs to remodeling the old one is always a new building with a lot less character, less features, less, in, less interest. And that's the comparison that's being made, the economic decision that's being made by the developers generally. Oh, so that's a before and after. That, that's our, uh, that's an 1880s uh, original Aurora City Hospital. Uh, I will talk about this a little later, but this is it revived now here very recently as part of the Copley redevelopment site. Um, very large project, important project for us, uh, for which the whole campus has been revitalized after 25 years of vacancy. So I wanted to put historic preservation in a little bit of context of economic development. So this is a, a quite cynical uh, quote from, uh, I, I took some classes at NIU uh, about planning and economic development. And this quote always struck me. And I could see some application for this quote for uh, competing. So essentially we're all, we're all local players in a regional game of economic development. Where that's not true and where I'd argue that I think that's entirely false is our downtowns. People that are looking at your downtown and my downtown and other downtowns are generally not, they, they don't have the same, uh, the, their, their why, their interest is not the same as competing or finding the best location for a warehouse or something like that. It's entirely different. So I'm going to spend a few, I'm going to spend a little bit of time or part of my time today essentially trying to debunk this for our downtowns. And I want to I want to show you what we focused on and what we what essentially what you instead of the cynical view that there's really no control, what can you really actually what levers can you pull and how can you function in a way that you are driving towards something? Not always going to win, you're not always going to land every project, but what can you do and what have we done to drive the success that we've seen in our downtown? So the way I like to think of this is that every every main street uh, has essentially has an inertia, right? Elected officials do not run for office because the status quo is what they're going to want to see continued, right? Everyone everyone's going to want to see an improvement of some sort, and we should all drive for that. Staff should always be driving for that. I would think the community wants to drive for that. Agreeing on exactly what that looks like may be difficult at times, but. Um, my, what, I, what I've tried to do in our group is that uh, we can't control all the economic factors, the, the downturns in the economy, um, you know, stuff that happens regionally that we can't control. But what can we do to help this uncertainty and unpredictability 
and drive more uh, developers to uh, take on projects in our in our downtowns. <clears throat> so on this theme of inertia, um, I, I I like physics. So I'm sorry, I've got a couple. Of, I also love, love diagrams. So I like to think about this as a pendulum, basically, and um, somewhere on the the amplitude of this pendulum, you would find your downtown. Uh, and we're we're all trying when we're when we're engaging in economic development activity, we're trying to influence where the the bob is on that pendulum. Uh, which uh, you know when when uh, Aurora's downtown had very little happening in the '80s, it was you know perhaps very close to sitting and you know straight looking like a plumb bob, and we needed to try and influence. Uh, what we we'll do what we could to influence some momentum in the right direction. So these are the levers that I would suggest that we're pulling uh, or pushing to try and influence uh, the amplitude of our pendulum. So infrastructure, uh, nurturing a business climate, enforcing ordinances and mitigating blight, uh, regulations that are aligned with local goals. This one I'll talk about a lot because a lot of communities do not have regulations that are aligned with what their goals are. Uh, uh, tax sharing uh, incentives, investment incentives, and allocations, grants, and fees. So as I go through examples here later in the presentation, I'm going to be kind of pointing out where the incentives that we had on each project falls in alignment with that uh, inertia acronym, and I could talk about them a little bit. So kind of on the front end of that, infrastructure, nurture, enforce, and regulations. So <clears throat> obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, developments need infrastructure. A uh, little quick story on our downtown, uh, Mayor Wisner was very interested in developing um, uh, new residential units in our downtown, as, as has staff been for several, many years. Come to find out early on in his uh, uh, term, uh, our, Water, our sanitary district, when Aurora's population, it's called population equivalence, but when Aurora's downtown population was declining, they were spreading their tentacles out further away from downtown Aurora, which by the way, the sanitary district started as Aurora Sanitary District, so literally started in Aurora. But what was happening is, uh, is the need for sanitary uh, usage in our downtown declined since basically since the, the mall opened. <clears throat> They were spreading their tentacles out. We, when we all of a sudden want to get more more uh, residential units in our downtown, we don't have the capacity in our sewer system. So uh, we under we undertook a very large public project uh, to install to decombine sewers on River Street and increase the capacity of the sanitary system. That system now is benefiting all of the development. I, I, well, maybe not Copley Hospital, but everything I'm gonna show you may not have been capable of happening without that investment, which was a was $14 million project back in 2007, uh, of which the city carried half and Fox Metro carried half. So it's important that the infrastructure uh, is aligning with what your desires are. We weren't gonna get anywhere until we had accomplished that. Uh, nurturing, I'll talk about a lot. A lot of the tools that uh, that I am passionate about are in the next couple areas here, nurturing the business climate, supporting the small business uses that are aligned with your community goals, enforcing ordinances. Uh, there are ordinances and uh, codes that help us protect ourselves from blight, uh, from uh, deterioration. Uh, IPMC is an acronym for the International Property Maintenance Code. It's a companion book with the IEBC, the existing building code, or the ICC, the um, uh, International, uh, uh, International Code Council, IBC, the building code. Um, so we need to use the tools we have to discourage people from allowing uh, vacant buildings to decay. And if you're not doing that, you're complicitly allowing your downtown to decay. And there were some decades in the past where Aurora was allowing that to happen. We didn't have all these tools in place, but uh, and then regulations. And I'll talk. I'll talk a lot about how the zoning, engineering, building, and fire codes can be better aligned for the purposes of um, <clears throat> redeveloping your downtown. 
And then I wanted to highlight the fact that nurture and force and, re and these regulation changes, generally they're little or no fee. It's just making sure everyone's rowing in the same direction and that you're using all the tools that are available. Um, in addition to that, you have to promote the fact that you'll use some of these tools, but I'll get into that at the end of the presentation as well. <clears throat> um, the flexible tools uh, to adopt as uh, for those regulations is the existing building code, which I'll, again, I'll talk about a lot. Uh, but if your community is not, not not only has has not adopted the existing building code, but not encouraging the use of the building code, then you're not promoting the uh, easiest and uh, most economical reuse of your existing buildings. So on the bottom, the other uh, levers to pull in this inertia to change change the momentum is uh, taxes, investments, and allocations. So there's a lot of stuff up here about tax sharing incentives, the feds, the state, and there's some local stuff here too. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but essentially they fall into uh, historic rehab uh, tax incentives, um, low income housing tax incentives. <clears throat> you could do local property tax sharing agreements as well, um, property tax assessment freezes. And then on the sales sales tax, you could share sales tax back with someone who's generated sales tax. We've used that before when it's applicable. Uh, and there's also something called a business improvement district. Uh, we have one of those on the east side of Aurora at 59, where that uh, developer chose to implement a slightly higher sales tax on their property and their tenants that then goes back to help the development costs for redeveloping what was Yorkshire Plaza. Uh, so that's one example. There's also something called preservation, preservation easements where the someone granting an easement to someone who's interested in that easement could re receive tax benefits from uh, the granting of that easement. And then public investments, loans, forgivable loans, um, proactive purchases of land, proactive purchases of property. We've done all of these things and I'll keep talking about them on a case by case. And then uh, public allocations, there might be grants, we might waive fees, and then the land or buildings that we own might become part of a, pa a redevelopment package for a developer. The little graph I showed there is a TIF, it's to try to explain a TIF, and I don't, is anybody interested in this? I, th I think I want to keep moving. It's a complex uh, thing that people, uh, we, we spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, tax increment financing, and essentially what that is, is is the developer is creating an increment, additional taxes that wouldn't exist without the development. And those additional taxes, so all, all the taxes that existed prior are still going to all the taxing bodies, still continue to go. And during the period of this TIF, the uh, increment can be used to reimburse the developer for the cost of the redevelopment. They also could be shared with school districts. We've done that. So it's not a complete loss in the 23 years for a TIF to the school district and then at year 23, or maybe you have a shorter term, which you can also do, all of the taxes jump up to what the new valuation would be for all the taxing bodies. So it's using future generated uh, property tax to reimburse a developer for a development that wouldn't happen otherwise is really what this, this, that discussion looks like. Uh, okay, so um, I wanted to go through kind of uh, our journey on the existing building codes, explain, explaining a little bit, maybe perhaps why I'm so passionate about it. So if you can't recognize this space, I hope everyone knows what the space is. This is the Paramount Theater. Please visit Paramount Theater. It's the largest subscription theater in the, in the country. It is right next door to you. Um, beautiful space. And one of the first panic calls I got where we were involved in looking at the existing building code from the building department's perspective, I was in the building department at the time, was that there was an addition being added to the Paramount, which is the grand staircase now, if you're familiar with the building. Um, and that addition was triggering uh, the uh, fire department to desire the entire building to be brought up to new building code standards. What that means for this space is your, that beautiful scallop ceiling that you see there is gonna have sprinkler, a sprinkler system in it. So we worked through, we were already familiar with this tool, knew it was possible to try and prove that it could be safe enough. And the premise of this existing building code is essentially that 
the, the new building code, is, it basically tells you what is the, essentially it tells you what is the least code compliant building that you can build legally. So it'll, it, it tells you, it's, I apologize of a Catholic reference, but it's kind of the Ten Commandments. You can't build something bigger than this square footage. You can't build something bigger than this number of stories within that construction type. The way the existing building code works is it's a puzzle, an individualized puzzle for every building that you get to work through and decide if that building's safe enough. And it's a puzzle that's being worked on by the code, the code official, the design professional, and the owner to figure out what the best scenario for code compliance looks like for that building. So I'm, I'll keep talking about that, but that was kind of my introduction to, and, oh, and by the way, for this, this building is not sprinkler. If, uh, you, if you've looked at it recently, what we were able to prove here was a proscenium curtain for a fire separation and improved proscenium curtain, um, a very robust alarm system in the building, which they were gonna upgrade alarms anyway, and they were gonna putting in an alarm system for the addition. Uh, and giving the building credit for the additional exits that are already above and beyond the minimum exits required for that space. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an objective tool that gives you credit for the good things about the building. It also takes away the negative things. So when we were doing that analysis, the fact that it wasn't sprinklered was taking points away from this objective system. But the fact that I had more exits and a shorter travel distance as a result of the more exits was giving those points back. So that's kind of, that's what, the, that's called the performance method. And I'll, I'll touch on that. I I'm, I'm keep jumping ahead and I apologize. I need to keep moving. Uh, so in the codes, the, in the existing building code, there are, there's really six compliance paths. And generally what everyone does in my industry is they pull out the new building code and they start their analysis from there. The way that the code books are written and, it, and I, I, have to, I also have to acknowledge, you don't have to adopt the international existing building code. It's a choice. It's a community choice. Um, if you don't, then your only choice is going to be you're going to look at everything like it's new. But what that does without having the existing building code is it doesn't allow you to do any of these analyses to try and make sense of these very difficult puzzles when it doesn't really make sense or you can't do something as easily the best example I can give you is generally in a historic tax credit project, the secretary and interior and the ship of the state uh, historic preservation office is going to protect interior corridors. Uh, a lot of the buildings I'll show you have, uh, let, we had a lot of doctor's offices in our uh, second, third, and up to sixth floor in one example. Um, you know, great uh, glazed uh, doors uh, with transoms, and a lot of interesting things that I, we should be trying to protect. But uh, without the tools of the existing building code, you you really don't have anything other than to say, you know what, it's, it's grandfathered, which isn't really def defined in the building code anywhere. And it's just, the, it's just the code official trying to be reasonable, but not having any kind of, you know, nothing to stand on, no limb to stand on. And if you don't have a design professional that's, a, uh, that's willing to go along with you there, and generally on projects where um, we haven't talked about this early, the design professional may have already designed it to meet the existing, the, I'm sorry, the new building code. So when they show up for their permit, if, if our offices are not being proactive to try and make sure that we intercept projects early enough, that design may already have occurred and that design professional has already got some clout on the line for design that they've done. And I am in the weird position of saying, well, we could have been more flexible, but you're kind of too far down the road. It's a difficult discussion to have. So early on in trying to get this, these tools used more frequently, we realized we really needed to promote this and frankly teach it to design professionals, which we now do. So there's these, these six methods. The, there's, the, there's new com compliance with new here at the top in one. And this IEBC, again, it's a, and I'm sorry for the acronyms, the International Existing Building Code has four paths within it. Um, there's and they, they increase from level of complex, uh, least level of complexity to the greatest level of complexity. There's repairs chapter, there's prescriptive compliance, work area compliance, and performance compliance. I'll talk about, so repairs are real simple. Many of them do not require permits. I mean, it's really simplistic projects. And, and in fact, it's so simplistic that it's almost not 
that helpful, frankly. It is so minimal. Uh, prescriptive compliance is helpful on very minor projects. Again, I would suggest too minor, um, but it basically says if you're doing this, you have to do this or allows you to do something short of new building code compliance. We've, we've used uh, all of these tools to some extent. The work area compliance and the performance compliance I will talk about in another slide. Oh, and performance compliance is where generally these larger projects we've used on most of them. I'll, I'll explain them as I go. That's where uh, our, we, Aurora has really become like a regional, if not state expert on this performance compliance methodology. So work area method. Um, on the bottom from A to B is a project that's getting more and more intense. So very simple projects are A, more intensity, projects with more intensity are D. Full code compliance is the red line at the top. And then this, this slanted line is just trying to suggest that the uh, work area compliance allows you to find a more um, proportional code response to the level of intensity of your project. So it's trying to, it's attempting to make the code response um, similar to the amount of activity that you're doing. Um, for anybody that's familiar with these tools, there's, there's, uh, three, there's alteration level one is B, two is C, three is D. And what I would tell you, and I'm happy to talk about this offline with anybody, but if you're in uh, alteration level three, generally I would suggest going to the next uh, option, which is the performance method. So the performance method is basically an objective math equation that has 21 math problems. I, <laughs> math doesn't bother me. But you end up with, there's, there's 21 safety facets that you're analyzing. <clears throat> so generally you would run through and analyze all of those and find that, you know what, the building doesn't pass. But the good thing about this tool is it lets you decide how you're going to pass, uh, get a passing score. So there's a there's a predetermined passing score by use and by construction type. And generally, what that means is you are going to uh, eliminate any smoke that's being passed between tenancies and the mechanical system. You're going to over detect your fire system. So as an example, there's a minimum threshold of an alarm system and a detection system in commercial projects. Since you're already going to have an alarm system and a detection system anyway, it's cheaper and makes more sense and less intrusive to your project to require to allow yourself to require more detection and a more robust alarm system if you can avo avoid sprinklering. And there's a couple projects that I will show you in a minute where we were able to demonstrate that very thing. This is where Aurora has... Um, really been teaching kind of the region on how this tool can be used. We built, it, it's, it's, this is an attempt to make it as simple as I could. There's, it, it, there not only are there 21 uh, math equations, you have to compare it in three types of safety, fire, egress, and general safety, and you have to pass all three of those. So it, it, we ended up building a linked spreadsheet to try and help our way through it. And generally what happens is, a uh, design professional and an owner will come in and in about two and a half hours, we will have worked through this entire process and they walk out understanding, I need an alarm system. I, you know, or I, you know, I, I, it, we couldn't get it to pass without a sprinkler system. But it, again, it's trying to make that certainty so you understand you're not guessing, you're trying to figure out exactly what the project's gonna look like and what our code response is gonna be. And I think I have a couple things that are more for architects, which I'm gonna blow by. Okay, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts and the more boring part of the discussion. So I apologize for that. Um, now we'll talk about some projects. Uh, this is a project, uh, the old uh, 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 block and cool building, uh, which is now the artisan lofts for um, the Paramount. And uh, again, on the left, and this inertia acronym, I'm gonna highlight the, um, the levers that we, help, we used to try and make sure this, these projects would work. So this is a historic photo of Block and Cool. And then here's a newer photo of the Arts Center. Uh, again, there's 31 uh, artist lofts above um, a restaurant and a gallery space. And 
the basement and a portion of the Stanley building, which is way on the right. He's kind of the lighter colored building underneath the western, mo the right hand most uh, red light there. Um, the, there's the uh, School of Performing Arts for the Paramount. So they've got space in the basement, space in the first floor, and then a gallery space for these uh, artists to present uh, uh, their work. This was a very, it uh, doesn't look like we used a lot of tools. This was a very complex project. There were, there were incentives used from the state, from the township, from the city, uh, historic tax credits. Uh, there were grants as well. And we also had to work with parking, but those were, those were some of the uh, tools that we used to make sure that that could get redeveloped. And by the way, that was, uh, Oh, it was it was Carson's till the late 60s when they moved out to Lake Street and then was really underutilized until Wabanzi used the uh, space uh, for their cam campus temporarily before they built the new campus in our downtown. And it was abandoned for a good decade and a half before this remodeling happened. Uh, this is Hotel Arthur. Um, locals, refer I hate the fact that it is also referred to as the terminal building, as it was vacant for a long time. But it was the, the ter it was the uh, terminus for a rail line that was on the eastern bank of the river. Uh, I like calling it Hotel Arthur, which is what it was built as. Uh, recently remodeled as lofts on Broadway. There's 20 units in the upper floors. This building, um, the upper floors were vacant for, I think it's 60 years. Uh, the, the last use on the restaurant use on the first floor had vacated for, I think it was two, uh, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. I think it was 2003 or something like that. So the, 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 the building had sat vacant for a long time. Um, this building, um, again, the infrastructure things that we helped the building with was public parking for those new units, water service for the building. Uh, part of the tools and the reason I, I talk about enforcement is this building was a blighted building. You know, with that, those, that term of vacancy, you can imagine what, what the building looked like. Uh, my first encounter in the building, I was literally crunching on uh, carcasses of pigeons trying to walk through the building. And um, the enforcement activities we had in this building got the, the previous owner who was just sitting and I don't know what they were doing exactly, but they were sitting on the building and nothing was happening with it. So our enforcement activity encouraged a sale of the building to new users and here we are. So that's, that's one of the reasons I stress that. We did use a lot of the tools of the existing building code this is an example where there are uh, very interesting doors, corridors, transoms. There's a um, uh, an original elevator, not in use now, but still there in the building, with a uh, filigreed uh, uh, iron cage around it and marble stairs that wrap all the way around for six floors. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, amenities to that building, which needed to stay. For anyone who's familiar with codes, a six-story atrium on a residential building is not good. We don't build stuff that way anymore. Uh, this building, because of its height and its construction type, the, the first floor was actually non-combustible, but everything above it was combustible. It's a 3B building. Um, basically, it means, uh, it means uh, exterior, rated exterior masonry walls and wood structure inside. This building was too tall to prove that we couldn't sprinkler it. When this current owner showed up, we had already analyzed this enough to know that it wasn't going to pass. So we could be more certain with them. You're going to have to do that, you're, this, you're going to have to do that. But we still work with uh, the existing building code tools to help their way through the tax credit requirements because the uh, uh, SHPO and the National Park Service was going to require all of those amenities in the hallways to stay. So we had to figure out how the code response worked with that. And the way to do that is through this existing building code. <clears throat> Hobbs redevelopment. This is probably one of my favorite buildings in downtown. This is our best example of Richardson Romanesque style building. Um, my involvement with this building was um, uh, we're heading back from vacation and uh, I, a very cold winter day, I remember. And that dome, the previous version of that, that onion dome had shifted. And if you're familiar with our downtown, well, Bonzi Community College is kitty corner, right? right uh, into the screen from here. So we've got uh, students 
faculty walking on these sidewalks all the time with this dome that has shifted towards the intersection. So um, we had already had the owner under violations, several violations. And ultimately what happened is the owners, there's actually, actually the building in April is, is here with me, one of my colleagues from work. The building that we are in uh, was given to the city uh, because there were violations in the building. It's the old home savings and loan building, but there was violations in the building. And ultimately the, the bank that owned it at the time didn't want to fix those violations. They literally handed us the keys. So our enforcement efforts can result in the ownership and then control for the for local municipality on what's going to happen with the, the project. If not for that happening, we would not have saved this building. This building was, there was also some structural issues. Um, if you look at the middle bay, uh, the right side of the middle bay, there were some structural issues that also needed to be fixed. And that complicated the front end of this project. The uh, developer had to fix that, get reimbursed from us. And then we started talking about conveying the building. So it complicated things a little bit, but this building has 31 apartments. There's 10,000 square feet on the first floor. And right now we're uh, working on three restaurants to populate that entire first floor. <clears throat> oh, and I didn't talk about the tools. So again, public parking, water, sewer. There was a lot of code con cons consultations here. And again, another uh, wide open stair. Um, this building did get sprinklered as well. And there was a bunch of reasons why. We tried to do some trade-offs, split the building into pieces maybe, and you could keep the building small enough that you might be able to prove no sprinklers. But in the end, it just made sense to sprinkler this. But we were willing to analyze that with the developer to figure out what made sense. And they ended up sprinkling it in the end. Um, we did use a lot of the IEBC tools. Uh, there are doors and uh, stairs uh, and atrium issues here too. Historic tax credits were a big deal on this project. Uh, interestingly on this one, so uh, generally tax credits with the exception of sometimes TIFs, but generally tax credits are a reimbursement incentive. You create the tax, you get reimbursed, right? That means money at the tail end of the project, these developers. Generally, the project needs money and capital on the front end of the project. So what happens, there's two, there's two things there. Well, what happens without what the, inter, the intervention that we did economically here is there's a secondary market to buy historic tax credits at a discount. So the money that the feds are dumping into the tax credits are being bought by other people who can use tax credits at a discount. So the money is not really making it into the project, not all of it. The discount, is, the discount is from the feds, is being eaten up by the the buyer of the tax credits. It's the way the system works. For and I don't I don't really recall the reason why, but in this particular project, and we've got a couple other examples, what Aurora did is we provided a loan and paid ourselves back with the tax credits. So that way, the money was on the front end. We were partners in the project the whole way making sure it still, you know, got done and uh, it made sense. And uh, the loan that the loans that municipalities can get are at a discounted rate from what, uh, from what a developer could do too. So, so another way of partnering and trying to fit, trying to solve that puzzle um, in, a, in a relatively creative way to make sure we could get this building redeveloped. And then we also did have grants and the building itself was uh, part of the incentives here. This is one of my favorite examples for the building code that we go through. This is the silver plate building. It's actually the, the business there is called Charlie's Creamery. This is an example of a building that's so small that without the building code tools that we use, this would never ever get redeveloped. The, the footprint of the building is like 1300 square feet per floor. It has one stair. Um, if you added another stair, you're going to cut the square footage down to next to nothing on each floor, and it doesn't make sense. In addition to that, everyone had looked at the building for more than 30 years of it being vacant, uh, assumed that they needed to sprinkler the building, which we kept trying to convince everyone they didn't need to, which we proved we didn't need to in the end. But this is so small, it kind of it, it, all, it kind of proves the point that the, these these tools would have saved this building, and there was really no other way to do to save this building. Um, everyone who approached it with a new building code would have put a new stair in and it just didn't, wasn't feasible to do. Just that move alone made it not feasible project. The other thing I really like about this building as an example 
is <clears throat> our Main Street buildings are not being developed by traditional developers. This building was so small, there's a traditional developer is never gonna be interested in this building. And it proved to be the case for 30 something years in our downtown. This was redeveloped by a local entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial family, sorry, um, who wanted to open an ice cream shop, uh, had other businesses and had some interest in one of their kids uh, get, using an apartment. The reason I think that's so important uh, I think it's a great story, but in addition to that, it's so important for someone in the regulation side of things like me to understand, I'm not going to find a developer who's savvy enough to know how to solve this, this building without my help. Not going to happen. So we, uh, and actually, um, uh, John, John Beertz was the one ultimately is a local uh, Naperville architect who worked on this with us. And we worked through why we could get by with one exit. There is a fire escape here that's allowed in the existing building code. And we um, over alarm the building. We provided a higher level of fire separation than is required by the new code. So the, the stair as an example, only needs to be a one hour stair. We made it a two hour stair. The separation between the coffee shop, I'm sorry, the, the uh, ice cream shop and the residential only needed to be one hour, it's two hours here. So we, we by using those trade-offs and taking credit for those additional hourly ratings, we made the building safe enough to get by without sprinkling. <clears throat> oh, and uh, we also donated some land here. So you see that the uh, picture that just shifted, there's a really beautiful little patio uh, on the east side of this building. Uh, we see people eating ice cream and enjoying themselves. It's right next to the, someone had mentioned the public museum. This is right next to the uh, Pierce Art Center just to the west of it. <clears throat> this is another example of a building that was underutilized for many years. So uh, the second and third floor of this building is this 30 North Broadway. Uh, we call it the Ziegler building or the Arenella is the developer that uh, finished the building. Uh, these floors were vacant longer than I've been alive. Well, not quite. One, for one year it was occupied while I've been alive for the second floor. Um, and uh, again, as a building that uh, with its narrowness, does not make, it doesn't make sense to get another stair in there. You lose too much footprint. There's really no way to get to, it's also very long. There's no way to get to the front or back facades for an exit for the upper floors. That was the challenge. I, I presume a big reason why it hadn't been used for those many years. <clears throat> so one, the, one of the tactics we used here was to not get you if you approach this building and you had access to the sides of the building you might try and get four units in there maybe so it's nice and long if you can get if you can get to the core center of the building for your stairs you might be able to access front and back um but that, that had huge code implications so what we ended up convincing this developer to do because it again avoided a sprinkler system it avoided a second stair was to just put two units in the building so there's two beautiful units very large units on the on the, on the third floor there's one on the second floor there's one and then it was remodeled uh, down below again we used we utilized a very robust alarm system to offset the fact oh, yeah uh it's over a thousand well, i want to say 1100 1200 square feet i want to say i actually probably have an answer i can share with you after afterward uh, so that was a you know it was a decision obviously that affects your ROI in the end if you're the developer. This particular developer and again another local entrepreneur, this uh, entrepreneur in town. This is an optometrist in our downtown. Um, redeveloped another building and took this building on. Uh, he didn't move his shop there, uh, but um, he did uh, take the building on. Mm -hmm. If you're not building balance. You still have the same dimensions. So th this is, yes, I, I appreciate that. That This is an example of a building where um, not saving the building doesn't really give you any great options either. In fact, it, in, in many ways, it makes it more complex. Uh, so that's what it looks like now. Oops. Uh, not in our downtown, but a very important project uh, is the former Copley Hospital that was remodeled into Bloomhaven and Weston Bridges here in the last few years. Um, this project also started off with violations against the owner 
Uh, we actually took the owner to uh, circuit court uh, with um, some pollution uh, and EPA violations ultimately. And uh, ultimately he was willing to work with a new buyer to the building. And we started a many year process to try and reoccupy the building. Um, the campus uh, kind of working from like the five o'clock position or four o'clock position there, there's the old nurses headquarters. It's kind of the T-shaped building there. Uh, that is now uh, district uh, 131's um, uh, school district 131's headquarters. They needed a new location. Uh, the city vacated a street immediately to the south of there, to the right of there. And it's now uh, on the same campus as Bardwell School, one of their uh, elementary schools. Uh, the small uh, structure that I showed you earlier is there at the, let's say, uh, eight o'clock position. Uh, that's the old Aurora Hospital. That is a white envelope space right now, and we're working with a cafe to go into that building now. And then working our way around the clock here, there was a teens addition to the hospital. There was a 20s addition as you turn the corner in the back. There was a 40s addition coming back at us. And then there was the 70s addition to the hospital and some 80s. Uh, so this was a campus that evolved over time. Um, the uses there now are in assisted living use and uh, housing for adults with cognitive disabilities is a really fantastic uh, combination of uses and the cognitive disabilities was identified as an underserved population in Illinois. Apparently Illinois is really great with um, not yet adult uh, individuals with cognitive disabilities, but apparently not when you become an adult, interesting. But it was identified as a need and uh, it fit into this uh, uh, project well. Uh, there are, there's actually an urgent care that's being uh, added to the building now in partnership with a VNA, a long partner with uh, the city of Aurora. Um, and it's just been a fantastic project, $130 million renovation. Uh, here again, we had a public park uh, development that was uh, something to give back to the neighborhood. There was a street vacation. We did a lot of code consulting on this particular project. Uh, there were violations of the earlier owner, many uses of the IEBC. I'll talk about that in a second. Very heavily uh, leveraged historic tax credits here, as well as a TIF, and then grants. So back to the uh, city hospital, uh, the original city hospital. This is an 1880s building. Uh, that's a picture from the 40s. Um, the uh, building was beautiful, and I uh, the one thing that I really, I really appreciate about the building, which no one could see anymore, frankly, is uh, in 1880, the city of Aurora must have had a fantastic mill, lumber mill. I mean, it, the, the dimensional lumber here was amazing. Uh, the joinery for the uh, headers over doors, as an example, was a, uh, a king post with diagonal cripples. There were no headers that we, we see traditionally with joinery, tying them all together. And it was, the structure was really, really amazing. Um, this building was a candidate that we looked at to try and figure out whether we needed to sprinkler it, whether we didn't, what made sense. We worked it through with the developer. To be honest with you, this one was closer to 50-50 in my mind on whether it made sense or not. They ran numbers and it made sense to add more protection and more alarms, more fire protection and more alarms to the building. And it's not sprinkler. Some of the challenges that sprinkling, sprinklering presented here is there's a really beautiful atrium. Uh, if you think about electricity that would have been around in the 1880s, uh, that cupola was actually functioning to bring light into the middle of the building. And those corridors and doors and transoms, um, getting the piping and all that stuff for a sprinkler system would have been a, a little bit challenging. Um, and it was decided to do it without the sprinkler. And we're like, say, this will end up being a cafe here shortly. <clears throat> That's the way it turned out today. So uh, kind of to conclude, conclude a little bit, and I hope we'll have a lot of questions and answers, but I really wanted to point out that this really needs to be a partnership. The use of these tools really needs to be a partnership, not only the financial tools, which is obvious if we're talking across the table about grants and loans and uh, TIFs and all that, that that would happen. But in order to get uh, the existing building code used, Really the uh, municipality, in my opinion, the municipality really needs to step in and engage 
to indicate to the design professional community, which we need in order to make this work, that we are interested in using these tools. We want to promote these tools. We're willing to work through them with you if you're not familiar with them. I've probably worked on 80 of these uh, projects. I would venture to guess the design professionals that I've been working with on all of them, I'd be happy if any of them had five, right? We get to see this activity a lot more and explaining to them what we would accept or not, or, and generally what happens in these meetings, the other part I wanted to uh, convey is it's a give and take meeting. And that's the approach that we take. We may, we may say, Hey, you, you can't do it that way, which, you hear a lot from uh, from code, code officials and enforcement professionals, I'm sure. But I also want to be able to teach them. But you could you could gain points here. So generally, what happens with a submittal that comes to us, even if it's not in a meeting, is we'll go through it, figure out if we what we agree on or what we don't, and then even offer, hey, this would make sense. And one of the other, I guess, things I didn't stress on the code tools is something called a design alternative. So out of the building code, the new building code there is the ability to have to to use design alternatives. And if you can convince everyone, the design professional code official that it makes sense and that you're generally uh, meeting the intent of the code, maybe not the letter of the code, but the intent of the code, that you might be able to use that as a tool as well. And we've done that uh, as well. So it really does need to be a partnership to use those tools all the way around the table. Uh, and I guess the other thing I wanted to stress is in adopting, in adopting codes, at least my, again, and I, I have to admit, I have a very parochial view of things. My, my background in municipal government has been with Aurora. That's it. I was in private practice before then. Uh, I did see uh, perspective from the other side of the counter in different communities, including in Naperville. Uh, but um, the, the, it, it's, uh, I, I would encourage anyone who's a, uh, preservation-minded person to encourage your code officials to at least adopt the existing building codes and perhaps even pro uh, promote the use of them and teach the tools. In teaching that, so uh, we, we were interested in using these tools for a good decade and a half. Um, a couple of years into that time period, we realized we were teaching everybody one-on-one, -on -one, which is fine, and then we'll do that all the time. But like I was mentioning before, we need to intercept the project so early that the lack of knowledge of the design professional to even know we're interested in having that conversation is an important miss for the community if it's not out there. And everyone who's interested in this is promoting the fact that these tools exist and that the community is interested in using it. Uh, so, um, We've I've given many talks like this to our chambers in the past, uh, regional groups. Uh, usually it's a little more on the technical side. You probably could tell on the building side. But uh, it's really important that everyone in this, in this sphere of interest understands that they're there and challenges, I guess, your municipalities to use them. Um, again, I look at them in the end as an economic development tool as well as a preservation tool. They're both. Many of the projects I've shown you would not have happened. And if they would have happened, it would have been for a higher ask from the municipality to chip in additional funding. So that's that's uh, that's where I was uh, hoping. That I think I went a little long, too, so I apologize for that. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, if there's we, – we definitely go through some Q&A period, but if there's interest to have more presentations, I think there's – potentially some interest from some other preservation minded groups that uh, have similar interests. And I think as Bill mentioned, maybe, or maybe as Tom mentioned, maybe we, this conversation could continue in different forums. Um, but I guess my larger point is we need to talk about these tools so that everyone knows they're available and challenge all of our municipalities to use them and promote them. Go ahead. So the, the question, in case uh, everyone online can't hear it, is there was a question about our residential historic grant programs and how they're applied uh, and whether they have to be in districts. So we uh, we do have a preservation grant program for residential. Um, predominantly, they are in uh, districts, but there are some uh, some locally designated structures that also could take advantage of the program without being in a district. Correct. Uh, boy. 
Is it 50? Well, I would have, I would have undersold it. I, I'm not, I don't, don't, didn't know offhand. So you, so Bill, it's Bill, right? No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I would have guessed south, south of 50 by quite a bit, to be honest with you. But the, uh, if there's 50, then those 50 as local landmarks would also benefit from our grant program. Okay. Not residential. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so the, uh, the first question was, do we have a list of properties that we're looking to redevelop? The answer is yes. It's not a formal list, but we do, as an example, we're going to be putting out an RFQ for developers for city owned property along Broadway here in the next month, month and a half. Uh, and we'll highlight what our desires are for those particular structures. Um, uh, and then we, you know, the city has bought property strategically in our downtown when it's become available because we've got plans. There's a new, um, what we call River North uh, district that we're working on guidelines for right now that we've bought some property in uh, that's adjacent to the downtown district. Uh, so the answer is yes, it's not necessarily all published, I guess I wanted to caveat, because there are some things we're planning on doing that we're um, you know, if, if we're trying to amass some property, we maybe don't need to, don't desire to publish that necessarily. Um, so the, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track of the second question. I'm sorry. Um, do, do you have I mean, like new people have heard. So we do have a uh, economic development partnership as well. It's called Invest Aurora. Uh, but we also have economic development staff members as well. So we have kind of a hybrid model on how we try and tackle economic development. Um, uh, one of the reasons I'm here is to share this information. I know there, I believe there's actually some city staff members. I, well, I know there's city, at least one city staff member online right now that was interested in learning some of these tools and we do share information. Uh, but one of the, one of my points I'm trying to make here is that, that we need to have more of these discussions to make sure that everyone's aware of the, of the opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, the, uh, uh, Residential Historic Grant Program is part of the budget. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, I believe historically it was funded by gaming. I think it's shifted a little bit because our gaming funds have dwindled a little, hopefully with our new developments that will uh, increase dramatically, I hope. But, uh, it, well, I wouldn't say constant. We There have been times when it's been reduced some when the economic times dictated that. We have been growing it in recent years. Uh, and again, if there's more uh, gaming tax available, I would bet we would. There's a, there's a strong interest in our uh, elected officials to increase it, I will say that. It's a matter of finding the funding for it and making sure it's in the budget only. But there is uh, several aldermen who champion uh, that program when it comes up to talk about budgets. They, I think they cap out at twenty thousand dollars the way we have it set up right now. Uh, it's a, it's essentially a matching program. Uh, so there, there's a, a, a private. It is. it is a matching program. Yes, the pro, the projects that we're seeing and that we rank more highly because it's it's an annual decision after applications are projects that are visible from the street. So stuff that improves the neighborhood, uh, you know, ornate porches, um, even even paint. Uh, paint projects uh, and uh, Victorian homes, as an example, have been candidates for that in the past. Go ahead. Question about the design professionals. It seems like the people coming out of an architectural school, new, new construction is where all the, the glory is. You said you had a, like a two day class. Is that sufficient to get an architect so, or uh, designer involved in this? Well, my answer is no. Um, I will say that. Uh, we, as design professionals, not, not only in school, but our licensing protocols that we have, at least in the state of Illinois, and I presume other states, aren't uh, gauging how you're doing with anything I've taught you today at all. In fact, certification requirements for ICC, as an example, I'm a certified building code official. Um, I'm a certified fire marshal with ICC. Um, those certification programs are fantastic and they, they and well, we're also, uh, so Aurora happens to be the highest ISO rated uh, building department in the state. We have a two and no one else has achieved a two in the state of Illinois. The reason we have that certification 
is because we have trained and we keep a lot of high, very high level of certifications. If you've ever walked into our building department front counter, you will see I, it's probably close to 100, there's probably more certifications proudly displayed from all of our staff on our walls to show how important we think that keeping up with the codes and understanding the professionalism and uh, uh, technical skills that we need to do our jobs well is important. That being said, ICC does not have a certification for uh, the existing building code at all, which disappoints me immensely. Uh, it's certainly something that should be happening. It's actually the most complex code in order to work with that tool well. So I started saying, I started saying that we're everyone in the industry is kind of doing code wrong. That um, unlike the older model that I found 24 years ago, which probably was all over the place, not just in Aurora, where preservation was solely the responsibility and perhaps even territory of someone with a title, with preservation in their title. Um, all of these preservation examples that I've given you involved heavy involvement from economic development, heavy involvement from the building department, heavy involvement from fi uh, the fire responsibility. One of the other luxuries, I guess I didn't mention that we have in Aurora is our fire department allows the building department since 2005, essentially the fire department has ceded building code decisions to the building department. Um, there's uh, also a uh, functional difference between the training that firemen get and the training that building officials get. So uh, also something that should change in our industry as well, in my opinion. But the fire department is training on NFBA standards, which the ICC codes reference. So every time you're designing a sprinkler system or an alarm system, it refers you to an NFBA standard, which the uh, fire services are experts on. We train on it all the time. But the uh, building code parameters before you get reference to the NFBA standards is not something that fire departments are trained on readily, and it's something they should be. In Aurora, how we dealt with it, Mayor Weisner uh, decided in 2005 that the, he would let the experts in the, those areas be the experts in those areas. So he um, allowed the building department to make determinations for fire code compliance from, I, from the I series, the IFC, um, for construction related items, including remodeling. And the fire department is, is making calls on schools, on uh, annual inspections and a bunch of other responsibilities that they get passed to them through the state fire marshal's office, which the, the other complication in their world is, unfortunately, the state doesn't adopt the same thing that the municipalities adopt. So the code, even if even if you were in the same, even if you were familiar with the ICC adoption of the state building code, I'm sorry, the state uh, school code, it's not the same one that your municipality is going to have adopted either. So there's a there's a lot of little nuances to the separations of things that we unfortunately have in our industry, which gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. So what's the relationship between the city's codes and the county's codes? They are not related. They don't have to be related. Um, uh, you know, and, and, I, and, and I would say our relationship with, with so Aurora's in four counties, our relationship with our counties is fantastic. Uh, generally what happens in, so we, someone started talking to me about this earlier. Generally what happens is the planning departments and engineering departments necessarily have more conversations with their counterparts at the counties because of transportation plans, regional trails. Does it, so there's, there's an infrastructure set up where those conversations are taking place so that they can do their jobs both at the county and at the municipalities. That, that necessity is not there with building code enforcement, unfortunately. So uh, with another reason why these discussions should take place, I would, you know, I should be interested in what's happening here. And if there's some challenges that are happening in Naperville that Aurora can learn from, great. If the vice, if vice versa is true, great. So I, another reason why I think these conversations are important to have more of them. Well, I think we better wrap up okay, I'm sorry. our sorry. evening out. No. Please, uh, but um, we have to be out of the, the building here in about 15 minutes oh, or so. Okay. 
So I don't think we're going to get arrested or anything. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize for people online if um, if you try to ask questions. I I, I thought that uh, we got it all worked out, but maybe not all of it. But but as far as John, thank you very much for coming My this pleasure. evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Spending your valuable uh, uh, personal time with us this evening and your, your the knowledge of you and your staff and your commitment to make things work is is really impressive. So I think uh, not only people here have learned, but we have a good uh, uh, cross section of people from across the Chicagoland area, and hopefully they got um, a, a, a lot out of this presentation as well. Well, thank you very so, much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It was very nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming, everybody. We have.